Good evening. Good evening. I'm David Oxtoby, president of Pomona College, and it is my privilege and honor to welcome you to Bridges Auditorium for what promises to be a remarkable evening. We are truly grateful to the Honorable Justice Sonia Sotomayor for visiting our community and sharing her story with us. I want to extend a warm welcome to students, faculty, staff, alumni, parents, friends, and Pomona College trustees who are gathered tonight in Bridges Auditorium, and to those of you who are joining us through a special live stream. Now, let me introduce Gilda Ochoa, Pomona College Professor of Sociology and Chicano Latino Studies. <laughs> Gilda, Gilda is a distinguished faculty member and an expert on education, inequalities in schools, and community partnerships. Her book, Academic Profiling, Latinos, Asian Americans, and the Achievement Gap has won awards from the Association for Asian American Studies, the Society for the Study of Social Problems, and the American Sociological Association. Gilda has written on education, Latino immigration policy, K-12 teachers, activism, critical pedagogy, and the factors influencing race-ethnic relationships, especially between Mexican Americans and Mexican immigrants. Today, Professor Ochoa led an exceptional master class with about 40 students and Justice Sotomayor. Please join me in welcoming Gilda Ochoa to the podium. Hello, good evening. It's an it's honor to be here to introduce to you all Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. I just finished facilitating a class with the Justice and 40 Pomona College students, and the excitement in that classroom was just as palpable as it is here tonight. We had a dynamic exchange. Um, the Justice expanded on her powerful memoir, My Beloved World. One of the many aspects that I most appreciated about our dialogue and her book were her intimate stories that open up spaces of human connection and deep reflection. About, about what are oftentimes considered family or personal struggles, but in reality are linked to macro structural dynamics. Living with a father who's an alcoholic, having a parent who doesn't always display love explicitly, growing up with diabetes, and struggling economically. And in the midst of all this, she shows us how she engages in everyday forms of resistance and collective action working for change in multiple arenas and with different groups, in college while at Princeton, in law school while at Yale, and as a lawyer, illustrating how distinct contexts require varied forms of resistance. One of my favorite parts of her book, and it's a quote, captures the urgency of change during our contemporary period, a period that I would say is marred by vast wealth inequality, racist and sexist violence, anti-immigrant policies. She writes, she writes, and I quote, my childhood ambition to become a lawyer has nothing, had nothing to do with middle class respectability and comfort. I understood the, law, the lawyer's job as being to help people. I understood the law as a force for good. Through the law, you could change the very structure of our society and the way that communities functioned. In this way, the law could help vast numbers of people all at once. With so much hardship and suffering all around me, the need for change was glaring." Unquote. Justice Sonia Sotomayor, 2013, page 255. As, as, it is her, as are her words, just as important has been her work. Both her words and her work are what are so inspiring. Born in the Bronx to parents who are from Puerto Rico, Sonia Sotomayor attended Princeton University, where she was drawn to sociology and psychology because of her interest in individuals and in communities. She became a history major. She writes that studying the history of Puerto Rico anchored her sense of self reaffirming for so many of us the importance of Chicano Latino studies, Asian American studies, and Africana studies within our schools.
While a student at Princeton University, she worked with Acción Puerto Riqueña and the Third World Center to push for Latin American studies and to push for the hiring of faculty and administrators of color. While there, she graduated summa cum laude. She received her JD from Yale, where she served as the editor of the Yale Law Journal. And after serving in several crucial roles, including as assistant district attorney and as a judge on the US Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, she was nominated by President Barack Obama as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. She assumed that role in August 8, 2009. The first woman of color, the first Latina, the first New Yorican to serve on the court. Tonight, we're fortunate to listen in on a dialogue between Justice Sotomayor and Professor Amanda Hollis Bruski, Pomona College, <laughs> Pomona College Professor of Politics and the author of Ideas with Consequences, The Federalist Society and the Conservative Counter Revolution. Please join me in giving them both a, a warm welcome and a round of applause as they enter the stage. Well, good evening. Hi. Welcome, everyone. Justice Sotomayor, I know I speak for all 2,200 of my closest friends here tonight. <laughs> for those watching in the overflow at, at Seaver Theater, including my daughters, hi, Annabelle and Eloise. <laughs> for those live streaming the event at home from every corner of the globe, and for everyone in the Claremont College's community, when I say it, it is an honor to have you here on campus with us getting to know our students, who, as I'm sure you've gathered by now, are some of the best, the brightest, and the most inspiring students on the planet. <laughs> I know my audience. I want to thank you for sharing. It's nice to be right, right? It is. I want to thank you for sharing your story with us and for agreeing to be part of our story here at Pomona College. Before I get started, I want to say just a few notes on the structure of the conversation with the justice. For the first half of our program, I'll be asking questions of the justice up here on stage. At the midpoint, the justice will move off the stage and answer a handful of pre-selected questions from students sitting here at the front row of Bridges. At this time, I'd like to ask that you silence your cell phones, put away those selfie sticks, make sure your safety belt is buckled and fastened low and tight across your lap, and please refrain from moving about the cabin until the event has concluded. <laughs> <laughs> now, without further ado, Justice Sotomayor. At the beginning of the semester, I gave a talk to the incoming class of 2019 on My Beloved World. In that talk, I argued that your book, despite the lovely title and the disarming, smiling portrait of you on the front cover, is actually pretty radical. And I explain that it's radical for a justice sitting on the Supreme Court of the United States, at the institution of government that is farthest removed from the people, that's insulated from public opinion, an institution that the public knows virtually nothing about, where the justices deliberate in secret inside of a giant marble temple, where the clerks take a vow never to reveal what they have seen or heard in the justices' chambers. That it's radical for a justice of this institution to write so openly so candidly and so personally about her life in the way that you do in this memoir. Now, I'm not going to ask you if you think it's radical because I don't want my authority undermined or my credibility. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask you this question instead. Did you take a risk in writing this book? And if so, what has the response been? A dramatic risk. I write in my preface that um, any time you open yourself up, you run the risk of being vulnerable. Vulnerable to rejection, and most of us fear that on some level. But vulnerable in another way, which is that people 
A, will assume they really know you, but secondly, that they will attempt to use what they know of you from that book against you in some way. And all of those things create a certain hesitation initially. But maybe I should give you the backdrop of the book, OK? Um, when I went to speak to my publisher, I asked them what made for a great memoir. And the, my editor, who, the man who ultimately became my editor, responded and said, authenticity. Be genuine in your book. Speak from the heart. The reading public will be turned off immediately if they think you're spinning a story. And as you'll learn from my book, I try to learn from other people's advice. And as I started to think about what could my book add to the body of knowledge about me, everybody knows the basic facts. You can look at my resume and know the steps I've taken in my life. So what would be valuable? And I realized that what would be valuable to some people might be the lessons I've drawn from living and sharing with others some of my frailties, some of my strengths, but to look at it as an opportunity to let people see that despite many challenges in life, there's hope. There's the possibility of not living in unhappiness, but of taking a path that can lead you to feel not vulnerable, but happy about your life. And that's why the title seems so perfect. It is my beloved world. Despite all the warts, there probably isn't anything that I would actually change. I've said to people, perhaps the only thing is being able to have convinced my father not to drink. But I wasn't capable of doing that. No one's capable of giving another person the drive to take a step against addiction. That I've learned. That every person has to find within themselves. But in terms of the things that I can control, I take all the good with all the bad and I don't think I would change anything. Well, I want to move into talking a little bit about the book itself. And there's so much that the students drew out of this book, uh, so much in this memoir. But one of the major themes that many of our students picked up on is the theme of empathy. You talk about empathy, the ability to listen and understand others as critical to your survival as a young child. You also talk about empathy as important to your professional success, to connecting with a jury. And then you talk about empathy, or really what I see as the breakdown of empathy and the powerful analogy you draw between your neighborhood in the Bronx and William Golding's Lord of the Flies. How do you practice empathy in your current role as a Supreme Court justice, and are there limits to that? I don't know that I perceive myself as practicing empathy in my work. I see whatever empathy I have as just being a part of me. When I listen to my colleagues talking about their decision making, I always try to understand what is motivating their position. What is it within them that draws them to a particular position that makes them think and, re and reach certain um, ways of analyzing a problem. And to that extent, I almost do it naturally. It's like, if I don't really understand what motivates you, it'll be almost impossible to convince you to change your mind. Because people only change their mind when the problems they see in a position are somehow dealt with. 
Whatever your needs are, you take a position based on those needs. And if I want to change your mind, I have to explain how your needs can be addressed in a different way, and perhaps in a way that will be less hurtful to others. And that, to me, is what empathy is. Not necessarily agreeing with someone else, but at least understanding what motivates them. And that's what I talk about in my book, is that kind of empathy. The one that says, no, I don't have to agree with you, but I don't have to vilify you either. I can understand what you're saying. I can understand the why of it and try to explain why that why can be met in another way. That's what judging is, isn't it? That's what being a human being should be. I think if we did that, you would resolve most disagreements in less rancor. Let me follow up with that. Um, by virtually every metric that- I hate being this far away from the audience. I know. <laughs> It's, it's almost like I, they're not even here. Yeah, it's a little scary, you know? It's like, I know you're all out there. Next time, move me forward, okay? <laughs> I'll, I'll talk to the people. Yeah. <laughs> um, so by virtually every metric that we political scientists use who study the court, the Supreme Court is currently as polarized or as divided ideologically as it's been since the 1937, since the 1930s. And yet you and your colleagues describe a kind of collegiality that exists on the court in spite of these ideological differences. So my favorite data point on this, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Anton and Scalia are good friends. Right? They regularly attend the opera together. Um, for those who don't speak Supreme Court, that would be like Nancy Pelosi and Ted Cruz taking in a production of The Lion King together. Um, you just can't that's picture the, it. That's the happening. best analogy I've ever heard. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, how do you explain that collegiality? And maybe empathy plays into that. And does this institution down the road from you in Washington, D.C., the United States Congress, have a thing or two to learn from you and your colleagues? I won't answer that last question, okay? But I'll answer I'll, I'll, the... I'll mark it as a yes. Okay. <laughs> You'll mark it any which way. I haven't said a word. <laughs> Um, when I first joined the court in August of 2009, one of the first calls that I received was from my immediate predecessor, Justice David Souter. And we spent some time talking about the court and about his feelings about Washington, which were very negative. That's why he, le he left. He really loved his home in New Hampshire and wanted to return while he was still able to return in an active way. Uh, and I appreciated that. He said to me when he first got there, he would get very frustrated at times with not being able to convince some of his colleagues that he was right or to see things in the way he saw them. And he said that he'd often leave somewhat anxiety ridden but that over time, he realized one fundamental truth that helped him love the court and love even the colleagues that he disagreed the most vehemently with. And that's the moment when he understood that all of his colleagues were people of goodwill. Every one of them every one of us, because I've really understood what he meant very quickly, unknow that each of us, all nine of us, are equally passionate about the Constitution, about our system of government, about the law as a valuable and important instrument in society. And if you have that passion, you know that that passion will show itself sometimes in, to be kind, acerbic decisions. That's, that's the understatement of the year. 
You can read some of our decisions and wonder, how do these people talk to each other, OK? <laughs> um, but if you ever notice, you'll see that the people who are the most acerbic are usually the guys losing. And they're that way because they want to take you and shake you <laughs> and make you see reason. And when they can, you can really understand the frustration that leads them to express themselves in ways that others might find hurtful. For those of us who are on the receiving end of that, we remind ourselves, we're the winners. <laughs> Sounds strange, doesn't it? And if you're in that position, you should be more forgiving. Because someday, you're going to be on the opposite end in another case. And I think that that's exactly what it is. It's respect for each other's passion. To the extent that you can't find a disagreement with others without respecting them, you're never going to come to friendship. You can only come to friendship if you truly respect each other. And I think that's what the court does. And disagreement's a little easier to accept when you have that understanding. Thank you. So when I solicited questions from students, um, I had hundreds of note cards to sift through. Thank you, guys. Um, I noticed a common theme among students who identify as students of color or first-generation college students. In their questions, they describe feeling what I would call imposter syndrome, the feeling that they don't belong, that they were admitted here by mistake, that at some point the world will find out and discover the gaps in their knowledge. You describe feeling this way at Princeton, then later at Yale Law School, and really continuing on throughout your career. Do you still feel that way as a Supreme Court justice? And what advice would you give to our students here who are experiencing this? It got worse when I joined the court. <laughs> um, these guys are smart. <laughs> Every last one of them. Um, and all of a sudden, I'm engaged in conversation and discussion with some of the smartest people in the world. Smart not just as lawyers, but as citizens and as almost all of them, as great readers, people interested in the world, both in its politics, but in science, in its culture. I mean, it's a little intimidating from a kid from the South Bronx whose favorite music is jazz and salsa. To listen to Ruth Bader Ginsburg at an event introduce an opera singer and get up and say, you know, I remember this person's first appearance at the Met in New York. They sang this role, and this particular aria was amazing. She, has, she goes to every performance of the opera in the Kennedy Center. She's done this for years and years and years. I can't remember the show I saw last week. <laughs> and she's remembering this person and exactly the role that they shown in. Um, do I like the opera? It got better when they put subtitles on. Then I could understand <laughs> it, all right? But I'd rather still go see a dance performance. Um, we have a dancer in the audience. Yes, clearly. <laughs> It's hard in that world not to feel that you, or to feel that you don't belong. It is very, very difficult coming from a background like mine, seeing writers talk about how different you are from the others, not to feel a bit intimidated, not to feel some of the imposter syndrome. Um, I try to explain what I do in my book, and that is I acknowledge what I'm feeling, 
Because I think the first step in changing anything is being truthful about it. And being truthful enough to say, no. I may not be cultured in the same way. I may never be Ruth Bader Ginsburg and have her total recall of opera. But I do my own thing. And it has value, too. And that's the same for anyone with the imposter syndrome, which is if you're comparing yourself to others, you're often going to find yourself short on something, especially if they have a background that's different than your own. But you're there for a reason. You're there to do something that's unique to you. And in fact, um, in my first year there, where my insecurities were at their height, um, both Justice Breyer and Justice Souter said to me that every new justice goes through a period of time asking themselves, why am I here? So it's not unique to me, and it was wonderful for them to admit that to me. Um, and that's something that all of you who feel that imposter syndrome have to start doing, which is don't measure yourself against others. Measure yourself against you. How much have you done to get where you are? And take pride in that, because that adds to the richness of your university and of the place that you're in. There's been salsa dancing in the Supreme Court. <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> so this is the final question for me here, and then I will release you down to the people. Um, you confess in your memoir to knowing very little about higher education growing up. You said there was just, it was a black box for those growing up and uh, sort of a, underrepresented and impoverished areas. Um, you recall a narrative when you were applying to college and your friend Kenny Moy called you up and said, try for the Ivy Leagues. And your response was? What's an Ivy League? Right. <laughs> right. Um, if you knew then what you knew now, would you have done anything differently? Or what advice would you give for our students here? How should they spend their four years? I mean, apart from clearly choosing Pomona College over Princeton. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. Well, I, I spoke a little bit about it earlier in a different forum. You know, back then, um, one of the reasons I chose Princeton was because it was close to home. And I was a little bit afraid of getting too far from home. You know, it was a security blanket that I could make it home in an hour and a half, maybe two hours with traffic, OK? Um, I got into a California school, and I didn't even come visit, because I thought, look, I'm not going to move that far away. Um, I wish I had had a more greater sense of security so I could make decisions not based on those kinds of fears. Um, and, and I think that drives a lot of decision making, and it may be the thing that hampers most people. You say, I don't want to take that course because it's hard. Well, a lot of courses are hard, and a lot of courses you do take are hard, and you still get through them. And if a course seems to offer some value to your knowledge base, to your growth as an individual and as a scholar, then don't run away from the course. Tackle it. If at, even if you don't perform at an A level, you'll get a great sense of satisfaction in learning something new that you may never have known about. There is very few or very little direct correlation between what you learn in school and what you actually do in real life. Maybe that's different for academics, but it's certainly not true <laughs> for most people, OK? Um, for most people, you just, this knowledge is not directly applicable to anything. But what it does is it improves your background of knowledge that helps you figure out how to face the new challenges as you move forward in your life. 
and it helps you deal and become a more interesting person. I, would I do something different? I think I would have explored schools further away from home. I think I may have become a little less enamored of living in a non-urban environment. I mean, one of the reasons I picked Princeton was it seemed idyllic to me. Uh, in my projects, they were fairly new when we moved in, and there was no such thing as sod, and we had a lot of dirt and not a whole lot of glass, grass, okay? And the trees they planted were scrawny little things that barely had leaves, all right? Um, I went to Princeton and there's this lush green campus with these collegiate Gothic buildings. And I was seduced. I thought to myself, this is like stepping into a fairy tale. Well, I don't know that I really should have stepped into a fairy tale. <laughs> Although Princeton, for a lot of other reasons, turned out to be right. I think if I were a student again, I would look for environments that provided me with learning in a way that would be different than what I had. I would pick a college who gave me a learning experience that would teach me something and teach me in method and approach something that I had not learned yet. I would explore knowledge more for the sake of knowledge. You should enjoy your years in college. College should not be a chore. It should be fun. Learning should be fun. And too many of you, as I was, get caught up in the grades instead of the process. Instead of enjoying that process of learning and expanding and growing, if you can keep that attitude, I think college will remain fun. And it'll be something that you value. There's a lot of pressure to do well in college. I'm not going to say ignore the pressure completely. I don't want you going out there and just taking dance classes, OK? <laughs> um, but I do want you not to forget the enjoyment part of learning. All right, thank you. All right, I'm glad I talked you guys into letting me get off the stage. I feel caged up here, okay? From my book, you'll know that I was a very active child, and my family dubbed me Ahi, which is hot pepper, because I jumped around all the time. Well, I'm a lot older now, and my mother still says I'm an Ahi. <laughs> I go visit her, and she'll say, why don't you just sit down for a while? Um, I haven't been able to, so I'm going to get up and wander among you, okay? Um, but there is one problem. Around the room, you'll see these very professional-looking men and women in suits, and they have little earplugs on. Well, they're my marshals. And I tell everyone, they're not here to protect me from you. They're here to protect me from me. <laughs> I think they would prefer I didn't go in the audience, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I do respect their job. And if you get up and try to hug me or crowd me, they get a little frightened. <laughs> and when they get frightened, they pull me off the auditorium, OK? So don't, I'll walk around, I'll shake your hand, I'll touch your shoulder, but please don't get up, OK? All right, I'm going to start which way? I think I'm going to, you see, they tell me where to start. <laughs> oh, this is so much better. The lights are not Sorry. blinding me. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Thank you for being here. Hi. Who are you? 
My name is Jonathan Contreras. I'm from Oxnard, California, and I study English and Legal Studies here at Pomona College. Wow, that's a pretty impressive. All right. The one thing you get for asking a question is a picture. Oh, yes, please. All right. <laughs> you had to do some work to come up with a question, right? I'm fine with that if you okay. want to move on. <laughs> Tell me your question. Uh, first, muchas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. Uh, Aprecio mucho que me invitaron. <laughs> they told me to use this. I almost forgot. <laughs> All right, guys. Hello. <laughs> it works. <laughs> There's feedback if I can use, continue using the lava room. Please go ahead. So, as a pre-law Latino and the first in my family to attend college, I've noticed the trend. <laughs> I've noticed a trend in both my studies and career ventures. As I continue along the path to a career in law, I am more and more isolated by the lack of representation of Latinos in academia and the legal profession, but also for my family and culture as I am forced to change myself to fit the expectations of this professional space. My question for you, Your Honor, is how do you navigate spaces that do not reflect and potentially do not welcome your identity while also maintaining a connection with your roots? If you want people to listen, you have to be better than they are. You have to know their game. You, know how to, you have to know how to play it, not just well, but better than they do. And so, yes, you have to learn things that you didn't know. You have to adopt the ability to speak in ways that might be different than what you learned earlier in your life. I'm certainly more, better educated, more articulate than I was when I was younger. As I learned to master English, I became better at those skills. But it doesn't mean that you have to lose yourself in that. I can still dance salsa badly, but I do it. <laughs> I speak Spanish and I maintain my language, not as well as I should. Every time I meet with mommy and we go to Puerto Rico together, the first two days all she does is cringe. Me dice, mija, tú tienes que hablar el español más. Translated, daughter, please speak Spanish more, okay? But after two days, I get into the rhythm and my memory of the language comes back. But when I'm in the courtroom, I'm a justice. And that's the role that I play, not play, but that's the role I fill. And I don't spend time trying to be something different than what the role needs. Because to gain people's respect, I have to be able to do what they do and do it as well as they do it. To hold on to who you are is not a question of learning how to improve yourself in a different area or with a different skill. It's holding on to the values that your culture has taught you to learn that it's not bad to love family, to love our food, to love our dance, to love our music, to love our poetry, to revel in using your hands, <laughs> to revel in playing jazz and not opera, to revel in all of the things that makes you a Latino. If you give that up, that's your choice. Because you don't have to. You can do both things. 
It is not impossible. Thank you. What did they tell me? They tell me to come back the same aisle. This is really bad. <laughs> All right, hello. Hello. Tell me who you are. My name is Jessica Fan, and I am from Irvine, California, and I am a first year here at Pomona College. I was just in Irvine not so long ago. What a beautiful place. I had never been there before. It's a wonderful place. I know. So is this one, though. Yes. <laughs> I'd first like to take the opportunity to thank you for being here tonight and sharing thank your story you. with all of us. And your question? My question is, what is the most difficult decision that you've had to make outside of the courtroom? <laughs> you know, regrettably, um, this week, um, reinforced the difficulty of the decision I made. Um, any number of years ago, about 2005, I think, my mother was diagnosed with failing memory. And I knew that she was on the last chapter in her life, not in the first, not even in the middle anymore. And she lives in Florida, and I was already beginning to think I needed to spend more time with her, that I needed to sort of make time in my busy schedule as a then judge to travel to see her more. And when I was called by the president and to see if I was interested in, a, in letting him vet me for the Supreme Court, I actually thought hard about the sacrifices, not that I had to make, but that my family and friends would have to make. I was gonna leave New York, and my family, most of it is either in New York or Puerto Rico. Um, my friends, I had some in DC, but most of my friends were in New York. And I realized that I would have less time for all those people who meant so much to me. Well, two things happened. I called my mom and I said to her, Mommy, I'm worried about this, you know? Um, I might not be able at moments to be there when you need me. And I don't know that I wanna do that. And she said, and it turned out to be true, you don't have to do it all. Your brother will do more. And he said the same thing to me. But the second thing she said, and the more important one, she said to me, Sonia, I worked my entire life. I sacrificed everything for you and Junior. My brother's Juan, but we call him Junior. For you and Junior, don't take this away from me. <laughs> so, I finally did say yes to the president. It was a very, very hard decision, and one that I knew that with all the positives of what being a Supreme Justice could give me, that it would also give me some negatives. And this past week, and this is private among us, <laughs> last week, my stepfather died. I was in the middle of a two-week sitting. I was able to break away on Saturday and Sunday, and I, on Sunday and Monday, and I got to say goodbye to him. But I left, my brother came in, and my stepfather died on Wednesday. And I didn't get back to Florida until that Sunday because I had commitments I just couldn't break. And not one that I'm sad about, but I had commitments here today. And so I left my mother last night 
and I would have liked to have stayed longer. So I'm serving, but so is my family. And that's a hard, hard decision for anybody because it never is just you. We don't walk in this life alone. We walk with others who make sacrifices to help us do things, not just for ourselves, but for others too. Thank you. All right, who do I have now? Hi there, uh, my name is Spencer Hammersmith and I'm from Miami, Florida. I'm a first year here at Pomona College. Um, and I just wanna say thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, so my question is, um, during your confirmation process, much scrutiny was directed towards a singular comment you made about the unique perspective a wise Latino woman could bring to judging. Given how freely the youth of today voice our opinions on social media, et cetera, how will the public documentation of these offhanded thoughts affect the political process or public scrutiny of public officials? That's such a great question. Thank you. And I'm gonna to talk to all of the students in this room. <laughs> the internet is indelible. When you strike the delete button on your computer, it deletes it from the face of your screen, it does not delete it from the memory of your computer or of the internet provider that has given you access. It's there for as long as you live and probably a lot after. And so today, when you apply for a government job, you give permission for the government to go on any site where you have, like Facebook or any of those Twitter accounts, you have to friend the government. <laughs> and you have to let them roam at will. Anything you say on social media is there forever. And anything you say will be used against you. The Fifth Amendment does not apply to social media. And look, you always have to accept that your behavior in public is going to be held against you. There was a young, brilliant woman in one of the law schools who took a job at a law firm and indiscreetly decided at the firm party on a dock in New York that she wanted to go for a swim and did it in the buff. All right? Um, when I was looking through applications, someone said to me, Go on the computer, find out about her. As soon as I read that, I thought to myself, hmm, I don't think I really want to interview her, okay? Now, she may have turned into a lovely, judgment-filled person, <laughs> but she will have to work probably her entire life to undo the impression of that moment. And so when you're on social media, all of you, before you touch the send button, try to figure out what will happen 30 years from now when you want an important position where what you said and what you thought hurt you. And if you answer that yes, touch no. I'm not sending, okay? Thank you. And mind you, I don't think the wise Latina comment, I said it when I was a judge, 
I wish I had been more precise. Hello, I am Emily Zhang from Arcadia, California. I am currently a first year at Pomona College, and it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. So my question is, recently the Pope came to address the United States Congress. You were one of four Supreme Court justices to attend his address. Though you mentioned Catholicism's presence in your early life, its influence is not attributed to much more than your education. At one point, you were even disenchanted by religion because your priest would not help your mother because she did not go to church regularly. Has Catholicism or your Catholic faith had any influence on your adult journey so far? And if so, how? <laughs> the answer is short is yes. And the reason is much, much more fundamental than people understand. I attribute the fact that I have chosen to live what I consider a giving life, a good life, to my Catholicism. The one thing about Catholicism is that it teaches you that the good and evil in the world is a choice that you make. How you choose to live your life is your choice. And to that extent, I always attribute the reason that I want to give, that I want to live a good life, not necessarily to entering heaven, but because I understand that that kind of goodness makes for a better world. And so for me, that's just fundamental to who I've become. And I think that religion, and it doesn't matter if it's Catholicism or some other religion, virtually all religions, they may not speak in terms of good and evil or sin or not sin, but all of them are teaching you to look more deeply at yourself and at your role in the world. And they're challenging you to be less material and much more spiritual. And that choice is obviously one that we all confront. Some people choose a path that I would not have chosen because of what I learned in my religion. I think it's dangerous to think of religion as merely the practice on Sunday. Religion has to be what you do every day. And religion has to be how you treat people every day. So. Thank you. Good evening. Do we have somebody else? Hello. Hi. <laughs> My name is Jerry Yam. I'm a sophomore here at Pomona. Uh, don't know what I'm studying, so I'm really jealous of some people who came before me. <laughs> uh, like yourself, I was an ex-temper in high school, and my question today is a little more lighthearted than the ones that came before and the ones that are going to come after. <laughs> it has to do with frozen yogurt. <laughs> so, the Supreme Court's institution of many, many traditions. My favorite tradition that I've heard of, however, is a newer one that Chief Justice Roberts started, which is having newly commissioned justices serve on the cafeteria committee. <laughs> now, one of your colleagues, Justice Elena Kagan, is rather proud of at least one achievement from her tenure on that committee, which is bringing a frozen yogurt machine to the Supreme Court. <laughs> I'd like to know what you did during your short tenure on the cafeteria committee. <laughs> and more generally, how other traditions have gone for you. Okay. <laughs> At the end of my tenure on the cafeteria committee, <laughs> the Washington Post did an evaluation of all of the cafeterias in government building in Washington, in the government buildings in Washington. The Supreme Court received a failing D. I 
I don't announce that fact with the same pride that Justice Kagan announces the yogurt machine. <laughs> I make no excuses. I couldn't control the kitchen enough, okay? <laughs> but in more seriousness, the court is filled with traditions. And you're right, that's a fun one. Um, Elena Kagan is now, I think, on her fifth year. Uh, Justice Breyer was there as the youngest member of the court for 11. He's very sad that he didn't break the record of uh, time by a few weeks. He admitted the other day that he regrets that he didn't call Elena Kagan and say, De delay your swearing in. <laughs> she couldn't have, okay? But the traditions have value. And it's a value that I respect, even when sometimes I'm frustrated by them, okay? We have, for example, there's an order of seniority, and everything we do is in that order. When you watch us coming out to see the Pope or to go to um, the President's State of the Union, we're stepping out in the order of our seniority. We walk into court in the order of our seniority. At lunchtime, we don't do that. That's the only tradition. <laughs> but even with that tradition, there's a tradition. Without that tradition, there's still a tradition. You sit in the lunchroom in the same seat your predecessor did. <laughs> they could take that seat and probably trace it back to the beginning of the Supreme Court. A little crazy, isn't it? Um, there's traditions about how we announce things, what our opinions do. Before Justice um, O'Connor came to the court, every Supreme Court case said, Mr. Justice blank. When Sandra Day O'Connor came, they had a long discussion about breaking that tradition. You would have thought it was simple, right? It didn't work out that way. <laughs> After a while, they decided to do away with the Mr., Mrs., Madam, Gentleman, whatever, okay? But why are those traditions important? We are not just individuals with our own wants or likes about how to do things. We are part of an institution. And if you can bear that in mind, you can control your own sense of grandeur. It's a way of putting us and keeping our feet on the ground because we understand that this institution will live longer than us and that we're charged with honoring its traditions because it's not the traditions that are important. It's the institution that created them that's important. And so for me, whether it's being the head of the cafeteria committee or um, not speaking out of turn at conference, those are things that have a purpose. And they keep us respecting each other and working with each other. And so, I'm glad you like one of our traditions. Thank you. Do we have another student? Wait, oh, yes. Wow, that's amazing. Okay. Hi. Hi, I'm uh, Shayok Chakraborty. I'm a Pomona freshman. Uh, this is my question. In my beloved world, you talk about your experience with uh, Acción Puerto Ricana, and you describe your disillusionment with uh, militant politics. Indeed, your whole life seems to be a testament to that spirit of reform over revolution. However, there are many who believe that political militancy and protests are the best way to demand reform, and particularly we can point to the Black Lives Matter movement against police brutality and institutional you have racism to slow today. Down. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was told that there's a lack of time. You know, that's what I tell what I tell lawyers all the time. <laughs> I gotta think about what you're saying. Slow okay. down. Okay, all right, yeah. So, um, 
Yeah, however, there are many who believe that political militancy and protests are the best way to demand reform. And particularly, we can point to the Black Lives Matter movement against police brutality and institutional racism. My question to you is, do you think militant politics have any place in today's political sphere? And if so, should, when should we pursue uh, quiet pragmatism, and when should we move to vocal militancy instead? Thank you. You know, people often ask me, how do you deal with discrimination? As if there's one magic formula to everything. It's like for years we lived with the thought there was going to be a miracle cure for cancer. And what we found out is there's a lot of different cancers. And some respond to some treatments and others to, to other treatments. Well, life is that way too. There's no magic formula to tell you when one form of approaching a problem is better than another. What you have to do is use judgment. And that judgment has to tell you the moment in which protest is important to do because it'll have an impact. And others where protest will have no impact because people are just going to put their backs up and never respond to you. Look, the protests against the Vietnam War, they were hurtful to a lot of veterans. They were hurtful to families of veterans who lost their children, or, or the parents of, of people in the military who lost their children. Were the protests necessary? Did they change things? You read books about President Nixon, and you understand that it did, and that it motivated his approach to ending that war. Was it right? Every choice comes at a cost. If you're a compromiser like I am, a practical person like I am, I'm willing to give up some things to get others. But I've given some things up when I do that. So my point is that there is no way for me to tell you when one is right or wrong. What I will tell you is if you get stuck in one mode always, it's going to stop being effective. You have to be flexible enough to look at each situation standing on its own and deciding what that situation requires or what the best approach is in that situation. I tell women lawyers, young student lawyers, women lawyers, it's okay to be soft-spoken. You don't have to scream like a lot of men do or be loud like some of them are. But there are moments where you have to know how to be stern to get attention. So you can't let your style control the outcome. You have to choose your style according to the need of the situation. And you see the lights going on, which means that... Uh... I should have answered that question with an example. Um, when I was at my law firm, I was there very late one night, and we ran out of paper. I was furious. I had been working all night in a law firm without paper. And the practical compromising me came into the office. I stormed into the office of the managing partner, and I hit his table and I said, this is not a way to run a law firm. <laughs> he was startled. And when I told him what happened, he said, okay, Sonia, okay, we're gonna fix it, we're gonna fix it. And sure enough, they, off they hired an office manager, okay? Um, I never ran out of paper again. <laughs> Small example but that's not generally my style. You're the last question, or I'm at the end? No? 
Oh, hold on. Yeah. I'm being told I have to go soon, so I have to answer you fast, okay? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello. Okay, oh. here. Okay, so I'm Jamila Spinoza, a sociology Latin American studies major from Richmond, California. I'm first gen, low income. Um, going to college here has been hard, and my question is, how do you pass on the knowledge that you've acquired going through um, such, such a like momentous and draining and exhausting, but also very valuable process? That's a, actually one of the best questions. I really believe in paying the back and paying forward. I'm a great, great believer in that. We have an obligation for those of us who have come from the backgrounds we have, who have reached a privilege that most of our community members don't have. We have an obligation. You can't choose to live your life just for yourself. That's just not something that you should ever choose to do. Because you're here because of all the people who came before you who opened the doors to this college to you. And you have to keep those doors open for the kids who come after you. Now, I've done that in part by a book. I visit students at high schools, middle schools, colleges, law schools, professional schools, and I try to do some of that. But you don't have to do it on my scale. You can do it on your own scale by making sure that every year you go back to your high school to career day, to whatever day they have, alumni day, and you talk to the kids who are coming behind you and tell them about, yes, that college is hard, but about how much you've learned. And that's your obligation starting on small steps. As you get more uh, successful in life, you can reach more widely, but you take it small steps first, and you widen your steps as your skills grow and as your position in society grows. But the one thing you can't do is forget where you came from. Please join me in thanking Justice Sotomayor for joining us and wish her safe travels. Thank you. This man was a member of the California Supreme Court, Cruz Reynoso, and he's one of the people who opened the door for me and how I admire greatly.
Good evening. Please join us on the North Portico for a reception following this event.